Welcome to Bedtime Fairy Fails. I'm Kim. This story was made possible in part by the live play D&D podcast, All D20. We'll tell you a little more about them after the show. This story was sent in by Not Jackson. Nice try, Jackson. We know it's you. This is a tale about finding that silver lining, creating hope and happiness in the face of darkness and evil, even when it's really inappropriate. This is... Tunde. Once upon a time, a party of heroes was on a quest to find two legendary swords. Their search had led them to a mysterious dungeon. There was something strange about the door, and as they walked through it, they could almost feel a shift in the time-space continuum. It gave them the jibblies. It didn't help that they could hear the screaming and crying of children in the distance. Let's meet our creeped out heroes. First, we have a tiefling bard named Twick, a blood hunter named Vanique, Brooks the high elf wizard, Bith Law, the human fighter slash artificer, and finally, Tomo Gozen, the Asimar blood hunter. Tomo wore a helmet that made her voice echoey and deeper, so no one in the party actually knew she was a woman. Now, back to our creepy descriptions. They could hear the drops of water echoing off the cavern-like walls. In the distance, the sounds of chains, whips, and screams echo down the long chamber. Wherever our heroes are, it's not a good place to be. They creep down the long corridor, eyes peeled for the source of the screams. Finally, they come across a room with a single vampire pacing around behind a locked door. The heroes quickly come up with a plan to rescue and or kidnap the vampire for information on this place. Prisoner or participant, she's got to know something. They bust down the door, weapons drawn, ready to attack. The vampire spins around, puts her hands up in the air, and screams, Don't hurt me, please! The heroes pause. This is not the reception they anticipated. Please, I'll do whatever you want. Just please don't kill me, begged the vampire. Tomo composes herself first and says, Tell us what's going on here. Oh, this is a terrible place. We're in a time loop here. No one ever ages. Time never passes. It's just an eternal loop of misery, replies the vampire. Where are all the screams coming from? Asks Twick the bard. From the children. They torture children here, man. You've got to get me out of here. I know I'm a vampire and all, but this is dark, even for me. The party stands in stunned silence for a moment. This was going to be a dark and traumatizing quest they would never forget. Fitz says, Okay, well, go ahead and tie your hands up and let's get moving. The vampire puts up no resistance as Vanique ties her hands behind her back and leads her out of the room by her arm. They continue down the hall, never seeming to get any closer to the screams, but never quite out of hearing range either. As they walk down the hallway, they finally come to a large door. On the front of the door was a sign that says, Do not open bear door. Wait, no. Wrong episode. It was just a door. But behind the door was one of the swords they had been searching for. Unfortunately, it was guarded by an enormous iron golem. Now, iron golems are essentially big, iron, man-like suits of armor that follow the orders of their creators. And this creator had instructed the golem to guard this sword. It was his only purpose, and he would defend it until the bitter end. The party attacks. It's a long and brutal battle. The golem is strong, swinging its giant sword at them and using its poison breath attack. The heroes fight valiantly though, as the vampire hides outside the door in the hallway, listening to the sounds of battle.
finally, after what seemed like hours, silence. The vampire peeks around the door to see our heroes bloodied but victorious. Vith calls out, Guys, I'm bleeding out over here! and falls to his knees, clutching his side as blood trickles out around his fingers. We have got to get out of here. He needs help, says Tomo. But we only got one of the swords, replies Brooks. And we're going to have one less fighter if we don't leave now, snaps Tomo. The rest of the party agrees, and two of them help Vith up and support him as he walks. As the heroes retreat back out of the dungeon, the sounds of screams seem to grow louder this time. And as they walk, they're met with visions of the poor, tortured children in their cells, unable to help them. When they emerge from the dungeon into the darkness, they lay Vith down to catch their breath and patch him up a bit. No one speaks. The horror of what they had all just witnessed hung like a black cloud over their heads. That's when Twix speaks up. We did it, guys. How about a song to celebrate? Are you serious? Twix, oblivious to their disgust, goes right ahead and breaks out into a victory song. Victory, oh victory, I'm winning once again. Victory, oh victory, I'm singing till the end. The vampire looks at the rest of the party and says, I think your bard is a psychopath. Maybe keep an eye on him. The end. This story comes from Ibrahim in Dundee. This is a story about not taking any shit. If someone throws something at you, you throw it right back. And if someone tries to take a bite out of you, well, you just bite them right back too. This is Mimicking the Mimic. Once upon a time, a group of heroes were heading down to the big bad evil guy's lair. They had been hunting down this guy for several months and had finally tracked him down to this dungeon. They were ready to face their biggest foe and were all pumped up and looking to kick some ass. Let's meet our fearless fighters. First, we have a high elf ranger named Cameron, a tiefling rogue named Venon Lasfael, a half elf cleric named Amara Farsis, Hugo Deschamp, the human bard, and last but not least, the star of this story, Juan Uroger, the warlock who had somehow become the party's tank. The party finally reached the dungeon and found themselves standing in front of a cave opening leading down under the earth. They took a deep breath and headed down into the darkness. The passage was long and empty. They hear nothing but their own footsteps echoing off the walls. They walk down the tunnel for a while until finally they come to a big wooden door. On the door was a sign that said, Still not a bear door, Kim. Right, sorry. This door had no sign. It was just a door. They inspect it for traps, but find nothing out of the ordinary. Seems like it's just a door. So Juan the Warlock walks up to it and turns the knob. They all instantly realize it was not, in fact, just a door. The Warlock finds himself unable to release the doorknob and yells out in surprise as the door twists and turns until his entire body is trapped. That's right, the door was a mimic. Now, a mimic is a creature that can take on the shape of an inanimate object, such as doors and treasure chests. Outwardly, they look nearly identical to the real thing, as they can alter their texture to resemble wood, stone, and other basic materials. They also excrete an adhesive that helps them to seize their prey as they eat them alive. So Juan is now totally grappled and helpless to move his arms and legs. The rest of the party frantically looks for a way to help, but it seems impossible to hit the Mimic without also hitting their party member. They watch helplessly as the Mimic's giant mouth opens and sinks its razor-sharp teeth into Juan the Warlock. He cries out in pain before screaming, 
You want to eat me? Let's see how you like it, you sticky bastard. He then leans his head forward, digs his teeth into the creature, and bites a big chunk out of its side. Oh my god. Did you guys see that? Yells Hugo the Bard in disbelief. Juan turns his head, spits out the bloody bite, and lets out a battle cry as he goes in for another. The party stands there completely dumbfounded as the warlock takes another bite out of the creature. It was the one screaming in pain now, as the warlock uses the only weapon he has to bite and tear at the creature over and over. The mimic bites back a few times, but the party can see the beast getting weaker and slower as the warlock eats it alive. Everyone watches in stunned silence as Juan takes one last bite out of the dying creature. It lets out a dying scream, and Juan is free. He stands up, spits, wipes his mouth with the back of his hand, and looks over at the party, all standing there open-mouthed. What? He asks. What's wrong? Amara breaks the silence first, saying, You ate it. You just bit it to death. Yeah, it was eating me, so I just ate it back. Says Juan matter-of-factly. Dude, you're insane, says Cameron. It's not crazy if it works. He replies with a grin. The party erupts into cheers and praises for the warlock's quick thinking. Oh my gosh, that was so cool. Dang, that Way was to go, sweet. guys. Thanks, good. Good. Yeah. 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 Great yeah. job. Hey, the whole thing. Wow. So remember... If you find yourself trapped in a mimic door, unable to move and about to die, just take a page out of Juan's book. Because no one can eat you if you eat them first. The end. Thanks for listening. If you like D&D podcasts, which clearly you do, be sure to check out one of our favorites, All D20. You can find them on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or anywhere else you listen. To submit a fail, visit our website at bedtimefairyfails.com or message me on Instagram or Facebook. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook as Bedtime Fairy Fails.